you know, the, the very essence of the mental game is this. The only reason that the event matters is because we make it matter. Welcome to the Mullins Farrier Podcast. Every horse, whatever it was doing, had a season. Once their competition season finished, they took the shoes off, they chucked it out in the field with some other horses, and it had a two, maybe three months period where it went and remembered what being a horse was all about. Even in a cheaper area, your prices should be set by your skill level, by your experience. And some people might not feel that they're worth, you know, as much as others. But if you're only charging $160 to shoe a horse, then the only way you're making money is on your trims. The WCB was a way to to make sure that you kept the trade alive. I think I'm a custodian of the trade. So it's like we have to keep it going. It was hard, but, you know, you adapt and overcome. And that probably gets to me where I am now. It's problem solving, horseshoeing's problem solving. And back in the day, it was problem solving how to be as strong as the older apprentices. So it's all about adapting and overcoming, which was good. I know we learn every day, but you do have to put yourself outside the box and and just continue to learn, which is why I was just trying to do my fellowship because I still have apprentices. And if I stay at my AW, I'm stagnant. Welcome everyone. Another short episode for you today. Recorded at Stone Lee last year, and I am heading there tonight to record some more episodes and hang out with podcaster extraordinaire Danny Bennett, who is the head steward for the International this year. And someone else I'm looking forward to seeing over there is Chris Gregory, who's presenting at this year's Focus. I haven't mentioned it in a while, but I feel like I should as I've seen a lot of posts about people pursuing their AFA certifications. Many years ago, Chris put a lot of time and effort into writing that textbook that we all know and love. And that textbook is part of the syllabus for passing both the CF and the CJF exams. More recently, Chris had that book turned into an audiobook, narrated by yours truly. So if you'd like another study aid, I actually use it myself, go to heartlandhorseshoeandschool.com and search for it in their online store. If you send Chris a picture of yourself reading the hard copy version of the textbook, he will send you a discount code that you can use upon checkout. And speaking of Gregory's, Cody is coming north. I'm very excited to announce a whole horse dissection clinic with Cody. November 18th and 19th in Schaumburg, Ontario. The cost is $350 per farrier vet or equine professional or $100 for vet students and apprentices. And that covers two full days of in-depth learning of horse anatomy. Due to the high volume of interest in this clinic, we decided to cap the number of attendees just to ensure that everybody gets a good view and gets all that they can out of the experience. So if you want to ensure your spot, please send an e-transfer to brian at mullinsfarrier.com and then list in the comment section your name, profession, and email address. If you're coming from out of country, please DM me through Facebook Messenger and we'll ensure that you have a spot reserved as well. Look forward to seeing you all there. And now for today's conversation. I focused last year, Ben Benson, the president of the BFBA, approached me about doing a few panel discussions. This is one of them. I hope in the future to be able to interview both of these gentlemen separately at some point. As you will hear, they both have a lot of information to share, and we only scrape the surface of their knowledge. Maybe I'll catch one of them this year. I hope you enjoy the conversation as much as I did. Okay, so I'm sitting here with two gentlemen who have been giving presentations this weekend, and we thought we'd sit down and just kind of do a panel discussion on what it is they've been talking about. These are both researchers. I'll get you both to introduce yourselves and kind of give a little bit of a background of what you do. Hi, yeah, my name's Mark Jerram. I'm a farrier working on the Staffordshire and Shropshire border. 
in the United Kingdom and work with a variety of horses, multiple disciplines and work with a lot of lameness cases as well. I'm David Marlin. I'm a physiologist. I work mainly with horses, but I've done work with, uh, with dogs, with people, uh, Formula One drivers. As far as the, the horse and the foot, I'm a real beginner. I know the basics. But what I was talking about yesterday was the things that go on during exercise in the rest of the body that have an impact on the foot. So, for example, uh, adrenaline levels, the heat that's produced in the muscle. Uh, so the effects on the foot I was interested in, but not from within the foot, but the things that originate without. Okay, now both of you have kind of focused on equine. Is that from your background? How did you end up here at Focus? I suppose really I've started looking a lot more at static and dynamic assessment of a horse, really. So finding a quantifiable and repeatable method of assessing that, really. So by going down the route of using Metron systems and also using IMU sensors and AI technology to assess the horse's movement, in a straight line and on a circle as well. It sort of brought me to this point where I've got lots of case studies and I thought it'd be an interesting aspect to share the process and how you can implement that into your farrier business yourself as well. I'm here because I spent too much time with Ben in Tokyo. So um, <laughs> we had some interesting conversations. My interest is primarily everything other than the foot. But of course, even as a physiologist interested in, for example, rider position, fitness of the horse, we have to have some appreciation of the contact between the foot and the ground because that is the only contact area of the horse when it's moving is the bottom of the foot and the ground and as physiologists scientists vets whoever you have to make some effort to understand what's going on in that area even if you're not going to become a specialist makes sense so i guess i would get you both to share a few sort of talking points that you like to cover in your lectures and some key takeaways for us as farriers that we can apply in our day-to-day. -day. The main subject of my uh, lecture today really was looking how to quantifiably assess the horse from a static and dynamic perspective. So it's very easy for some owners and clients to forget how bad horsey feet were at one point when you took them on. So it's been able to record that accurately. So by using a block similar to an x-ray block, he has calibrated screw heads on there to process them through software for measuring dorsal wall angle, heel angle, heel migration, and then looking for any medial lateral wall deviations from a dorsal perspective, looking at sole parameters there. But then also combining that with assessment of a horse in motion. And there's many things we can miss with our own eye and sometimes misinterpret. Don't get me wrong, we still need to be able to see how a horse moves and understand how a horse moves and get feedback from riders and understand what a lame horse looks like. But there are little intricate details we can miss. And that's where I've, I've brought in the IMU sensor-based Workman Black software, which then starts to then detect who flights, the breakover, the landing, any deviations of the swing phase of a stride and any sort of instability during a stance phase of a stride as well. And the timings of those as well, compared left versus right and, and see if there's any asymmetry of timings. But in my experience as well, I found that just using one system alone is not really enough. You can't just rely, focus your Ferry protocols on one style and one system. So to expand upon that, I want to look at the body movements. And having had some experience at the Royal Vet College of working with the Equigate software, I come across something that's fairly similar uh, using AI technology called Sleep AI. And I've used that at the same time as assessing horses using Workman Black, seeing horses moving straight and on the circle. Because that tends to then detect any pole or pelvic vertical displacement. So the purpose of my lecture today was introducing that to farriers. What we're looking for when we assess these and how to integrate that with what we apply to the feet and record these findings over a period of time. Sending that report then to contralateral, you know, to paraprofessionals such as vets and physios. And then we've got, you know, an interest in the horse, really, to for the betterment of that, because they may be able to use that information to enhance what they're doing. But also to use it responsibly, you know, it doesn't remove from the fact you still have to be able to trim feet, make shoes, fit shoes, be able to see where a horse moves, get feedback from riders. It's an assist to your everyday work. It's, it's a bit like a, a VAR referee in football, effectively. You know, it finds out the intricate details and may pick up a few things that may get missed. And again, it, just, it creates a little bit of protection to the protocols we apply. And also, you know, if the horse needs to go for an insurance claim or anything like that, they've got some evidence of what's been done and the change we made to that horse from a, you know, a black and white perspective rather than personal opinion. 
I just wanted to mention one of the things that's really interesting is Mark just mentioned two technologies that I use as well. So I use Equigate and Slope AI. So it's great that even though I'm interested in a different aspect of what's going on, we're using similar types of technology. And I think the more people who are using that, it's easier to then see what the potential benefits are, for not just for research, but as you say, for clinical applications as well. Yesterday, what I was talking about, say primarily, say was the effects of exercise in the rest of the body. One of the real things that I think we still overlook and that I use a lot with clients I work with is we in general what we call cryotherapy, but you know, in simple terms, it's just an ice pack around the foot or around the leg. Horses deal really well with cold. So if you look at the ability of the lower limb to tolerate cold, it's really, really good. But if you look at the other end of it, heat, heat really isn't that great for the feet. And in fact, about 15 years, 20 years ago, I think maybe, I was ended up with Chris Pollitt at an endurance client in the Gulf who was having a lot of foot problems. And we went out to where the horses were in the middle of the day out on the sand. Now, they had shade, of course, being horses, they don't use the shade. But what we were measuring was surface sand temperatures like 60 degrees and hoof temperatures of 48 degrees. Now, frying the feet, I guess, can't be that great for them. And my approach, wild horses don't spend a lot of time galloping around getting really, really hot. They pretty much just walk everywhere. So I don't think their feet or their legs or their tendons really get that hot. Whereas when we're training them and competing them, they get incredibly hot. So the use of ice for me is a really important thing in trying to manage domesticated horses when we're competing them. I see much less problems where ice is used compared to where it's not used. Anecdotal. (laughs) An interesting thing, and this is something from a farrier's perspective. So a lot of what we have used for eons has been anecdotal knowledge. And then as science has brought its way in, there are times where something can be touted as science and it's not necessarily well-founded or well-backed research. It's just somebody had an axe to grind or a shoe to sell and then the research just happened to back that up. Can you both sort of share things from a farrier's perspective that we can look to to know whether or not something is legitimate or it's it's maybe being pushed for other reasons. It's not necessarily proper research. Yes, absolutely. I mean, there's different levels of scientific uh, validation, effectively. There's this pyramid that goes round, and it shows you like the base level, which is anecdotal, all the way up to like systemic review or systematic review, I think it's called, something like that. But basically, it goes up the levels. You need to have uh, you know a peer-reviewed study, a blind study, a double-blind study. So effectively... To put it in simple terms, a double-blind study is when you don't know what the effect is and you're not being told which horses are going to be affected by it. You know, So things like supplementation to horses' feet, that could be done through a double-blind study. Anecdotal, I think is a lot of farriery is based on that anecdotal. It's been passed down through generations with no true sort of review on what's accurate and what's not. And you have to be mindful, of course, of conflicts of interest statements. You know, You have to make sure that if there is a study that is taking place that it's not funded by a particular horseshoe company to try and sell a particular horseshoe you know you have to be mindful about where that's coming from a good rule of thumb is to look through the veterinary journals because they've been heavily peer-reviewed journals such as equine veterinary journal and eve and things like that there's a whole load of them out there but they provide a good quality science for you to, to look at no aspects of science is perfect in the slightest but you get different qualities and the more rigorous we are with the checks of that the more we can rely on what's in front of us. Yeah, I I totally agree with Mark. I think you summed it up perfectly. There's things out there that we are now being told. For example, rest ice compression elevation. It was the standard for many years for treatment of acute injury. And about 15, 20 years ago, there started a movement to say rice is wrong. And when you look back at where that movement originated from. Loads of people then jumped on the bandwagon, medics, scientists. But when you go back and look who started that movement, it was a guy who had developed an alternative technology for managing acute injuries. And nobody ever remembers that. So this guy trashed rest ice compression elevation. And actually, there's nothing wrong with rest ice compression elevation. It was just he had an ulterior motive to trash it so that he could sell more technology. And I think People marketing are always very clever. 
they're often a lot cleverer than I am. You know, they, they know how to push the buttons to get the message to make people want to buy stuff. I always say, if it looks too good, it probably is. <laughs> I'm very cynical. Well, you mentioned one area where you can look for research. Are there other resources that either of you can think of that we as farriers should be checking out? When I was um, working with the Forge editorial panel, I was really pushing the peer-reviewed process through that, really. And there has been some farriery peer-reviewed papers through that, through Forge magazine, which is the official magazine of the BFBA. However, there needs to be more. We need more farriers to come in with research. We have access to hundreds of horses, each of us. And it doesn't matter what aspects we want to look at. It's affordable to be able to do this research, particularly things like Metron or anything like that. And the, you know, the gait analysis we are using now, we have the horse. When vets see horses, they don't see them when they're wrong. They don't see them when they're lame and they're injured and nobody wants a vet bill. But we see horses as a routine thing. We can see these subclinical changes and we should be able to record that and then you know get that peer reviewed as well. There are obviously courses out there now which involve science and farrowing. You know, there's the degree course at the University of Central Lancashire. I'm not sure if it's still going, but there's the graduate diploma of the RBC. I've been lucky enough to complete both courses. The process of learning and understanding how to interpret data and then appropriately statistically analyze that can bring about some incredibly interesting things. And if I can do that, I'm sure any Farry here can do that. Scientific papers are written in a very particular style, and sometimes they're not that easy to appreciate what the key message is and how you know how important it is and i think people like mark who are involved in research can help other farriers understand that science by effectively saying well this paper has been published it's going to take you three hours to read you may not understand it all but here are the key points and i think having something through the bfpa where you are producing a summary of research and translating it for farriers who don't want to go and read the full paper, but to understand the implications of research. I think that is perhaps a good way to get more farriers in, interested in the science. Because there, as Mark says, there's a huge amount now of, of new science on farriery coming out, and it's good stuff as well. One of the biggest issues that you would run into in doing this research is having it funded. So how does one go about that process? Well, that's a tricky one. I've done a couple of free pieces of research. It depends which level you want to go to at it, really. I did a fairly simple study looking at frog health a few years ago. It was peer-reviewed and published in the BFBA Forge. And basically, I took 50 horses with thrush in the frog and 50 horses with no thrush in the frog. These horses, some of them I go to, I'm the only person that picks the horse's feet out, you know, and they're not getting it. And you get these people who are picking horses horse every day, cleaning and treating them, and they're still getting it. So where's the common denominator here? So I took a simple pH probe into their paddock and assessed the pH level and everyone that had got thrush infection had alkaline pH 7 or above. Now that was dirt cheap to do. You know, that took like less than 30 quid to do. But if you want to start looking at pressure mats and, you know, anything like that, it's going to cost money and you're probably going to need an invite from a college or go and take part on a course at a college, which did a few thousand to take part and do these degrees. It is tax deductible and it just progress you the same way as the virtual company exams do, just in a slightly different perspective. But I'd highly recommend it. I find it so much fun, but you have to you know, want to do it and enjoy it. That's my main key point, I think. Research is expensive. To do, say, a study on a hoof supplement under controlled conditions with ethical approval, blood samples, something like that, you could be easily looking at a quarter of a million pounds to do a decent study over six months. In this country, we also have the problem that if you're doing any research which is invasive, requires blood samples, you're probably going to need ethical approval. You may need a home office license. So in a way, it's good because it's protecting animal welfare. But in a, another way, it's become harder and harder to do research, I would say, in the UK compared to, for example, the States. I'm not saying the States has lower standards. The standards are the same, but the regulation of it by a government level is much different in the States. And yeah, and research is expensive, bits of kit. I mean, I've, I've got a pressure system, it's 15 grand. And if I break the mat, that's another three grand. So <laughs> the stuff's expensive. It's about basically really, if, if you can get access to that and get the funding to that. But at the same time, there are also research aspects that can be done with cadaver limbs, where it's, it's less likely you're going to need ethical approval. But when we start taking radiographs of live horses, that requires ethical approval to a point. But again, using the systems I showed 
day, you're not really going to need ethical approval as, as for so much of that. You still need to be accurate with it. You probably still need a mentor to make sure you're doing it correctly and, and properly to get some good, reliable data. Consider those as well. It's not to be uh, sniffed at really because there's still plenty of information we can get from that. Okay, well, thank you both for participating in this and for doing what you do because as farriers, we do need this to happen and not all of us are well equipped for what you do. So we really appreciate you. Pleasure. Thank you very much.